It's a great pleasure and a great honor to be here. Thank you, Lydia, for inviting me to this talk. Like many of you in the audience, I knew Ken Kennedy. I served on many committees, both national and international, with him. And like all of you, I miss his technical leadership, his vision, and his sense of humor. So when I was preparing this talk, I wanted to start with a picture of Ken. And I found this really nice picture of him on uh, your website. And so I thought I'd put that up there because I think it captures what one might call the spirit of Ken Kennedy. From the earliest days of parallel computing, which I would date back to roughly around 1970, people recognized that parallel architectures, parallel hardware, was very complicated, far too complicated for the vast majority of programmers who just want to get their jobs done. They're not interested in spending a lifetime getting to understand all the details of parallel architectures and computers. We're going to call these programmers Joe programmers. So they're domain experts, but they don't necessarily want to learn a lot about computer architecture. They just want to get their job done. There's only one way that I know of to hide complexity, and that is through abstraction. And so the goal then is to design abstractions that hide enough of the complexity of parallel architectures that it makes Joe's life easier. So in particular, the way we call it, it increases their productivity. Now, of course, somebody has to implement these abstractions. And so we rely on a small number of a very different kind of programmers that we'll call Stephanie programmers. These are expert parallel programmers, and what they do is to implement these abstractions efficiently. And so you have both productivity and performance by distinguishing between these two classes of programmers. The question, of course, is what should these abstractions be? So if these abstractions are very high level. It makes Joe's life easier, but it makes Stephanie's life very difficult because it may be very difficult to implement these abstractions efficiently on whatever parallel architecture you want to run on. Of course, at the other extreme, if these abstractions are very low level, you really haven't done anything for Joe programmers, so people won't use your abstractions anyway. So what we seek then is a sort of a golden mean, abstractions that are high enough that they hide a lot of the complexity of parallel architectures that makes it worthwhile for the Joes to use them, and at the same time can be implemented efficiently by these expert parallel programmers, the small number of expert parallel programmers, the Stephanies. So these are the research questions that have animated my field and Ken Kennedy's field for many years now. So what should these abstractions be? How should they be implemented? Now, back when Ken was in his prime, so 70s, 80s, 90s, right? He and one of his uh, uh, colleagues, David Cook, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, they had a particular approach to solving this problem. And we can call that approach parallelizing compilers. Ken made many contributions, but I think this is one of his key contributions that he's very well known for. This is an idea that goes back to the early 70s when people started designing and implementing SIMD and vector machines like the ILIAC 4, Cray 1, and so on. And people recognized that writing vector code was going to be very hard. So the question is, where do the vector instructions come from? And the approach that David Cook and Ken Kennedy and the many people who flocked around them followed their footsteps, the approach that they took was to say, let's just start with sequential programs and then we'll make the compiler responsible for finding vector instructions in these sequential programs. So you don't explicitly write vector code or anything like that. You write for loops, do loops, whatever it is, and then the compiler is going to find vector instructions. I want to give you a flavor of how this kind of compiler technology works. So this is the first loop you can see. is a for loop, and if you look at the iterations of the for loop, you notice that each iteration is reading and writing from different locations from every other iteration. So the ith uh, iteration is reading and writing from AFI, and that's different from all the other iterations. So there are no overlaps between the read-write sets, and so there are no dependencies, as we call it, between the different iterations. And so we can generate vector code for this. And in fact, LLVM and all kinds of compilers that we use nowadays, GCC, 
can take a loop like that and generate vector code. The second loop over there shows a subtlety. It looks almost like the first one. However, if you look at the subscripts, you notice that this is actually a recurrence, right? Each iteration is computing a value, writing it into AFI, and then that's being read in the next iteration. So in fact, there are dependencies between successive iterations. Vectorizing compilers will leave this loop alone and say, I can't generate vector code out of this. Now, there are ways to exploit algebraic properties of addition and so on. We're not going to worry about that for this discussion. And the third loop looks both like the first one and the second one. So you might wonder, well, are there dependencies or not? But if you look at the read-write sets, you notice that the writes are all happening to even locations of the array, and the reads are happening from odd locations of the array. So again, there are no dependencies between these iterations, and you can generate vector code, and all compilers today will generate vector code, even from a relatively complicated subscript expressions like that. So this is the approach that Ken and David Cook uh, uh, advocated. So you make the compiler responsible for finding parallelism from programs that are written using conventional programming languages. And starting in the 80s, 90s, there were a whole lot of dependence tests that were invented uh, at Rice, at uh, Urbana, various other places, and they go by names like GCD, Banerjee, Lambda, Omega, and so on. At some point, uh, the French school of compilers, led by Paul Foutrier, showed us that all of these tests could be subsumed essentially into integer linear programming. So the subscripts analysis that we were doing, odd, even, et cetera, et cetera, you can just formulate all of these dependence problems as an integer linear programming problem. So I've shown that on the road right at the bottom. And again, the, you know, the details are not terribly important. <coughs> But today, this integer linear programming technology, this idea of analyzing loops, finding dependencies, this is there in all compilers, ICC, GCC, LLVM, and so on. So it's been a great success. And uh, in particular, in some of these domains, like dense linear algebra, for example, we can start with just a very high level description of Cholesky factorization, for example, or matrix multiplication, and then use compiler technology to generate very efficient code optimized for both, say, multi-core as well as the memory hierarchy. We can do the same thing with stencil codes, so finite differences that I'm sure many of you use. So you can just specify the stencil, and then the compiler, using this kind of technology, can generate very efficient code with what are known as space tiling and time tiling. So very complicated if you had to write it by hand, but today we know how to generate all of that complicated, optimized code using this kind of restructuring or parallelizing compiler technology. And then you can do the same thing with sparse direct methods, like sparse LU factorization or sparse Cholesky factorization, although there the compiler can't do very much, but people use the idea of dependencies when they write libraries for uh, sparse direct methods. And this is based on work back in the 70s, late 70s by Ian Deff and uh, Duff and Raid. So this whole dependence-based approach, take a serial program, look at loops, analyze dependencies, find what can be done in vector mode or parallel mode, has been very successful. The question is, what happens when you go beyond matrix programs? So these are what we call irregular programs. And there's no formal definition of what an irregular program is. But these are programs that intuitively deal with pointer-based data structures. So they're not dealing with matrices, but they're dealing with pointer-based data structures like lists, trees, graphs, and so on. So what I've shown on the right is some pseudocode. And what you notice is there aren't any dense matrices there. In fact, there are no matrices of any kind. There are no subscripts. So there's nothing to analyze as far as all this integer linear programming goes. However, there is a loop there, a while loop. So what you could try and do is to see whether the different iterations of that while loop are independent. So there's a particular kind of dependence analysis that's required there. It's called points to and shape analysis. So they mimic essentially the kind of analysis that's done with, for arrays using integer linear programming. Unfortunately, even though there was about 20 years of work on points to and shape analysis, None of those techniques succeeded in finding parallelism in these kinds of applications. So the compile time test would always come back and say, there may be dependencies between different iterations, so you can't run these iterations in parallel. 
And so people wondered, well, does this mean that there's no parallelism in these kinds of applications, or perhaps we need more sophisticated dependence analysis tests? So the jury was out on those kinds of questions. This is roughly where we came in. <clears throat> so starting in the late 90s, so this is a research program we've been involved in for about 20 years now. So here is the way we approached the problem. We said rather than look at the text of the program, look for loops, subscripts, and so on and so forth, let's remember what Niklaus Wirth, who won the Turing Award, as you probably know, for his contributions to compilers and to programming languages, he had a book long time ago that said program equals algorithm plus data structure. So instead of looking at the program and trying to analyze it automatically using compilers, let's try and understand what the underlying algorithm and the data structures are. So what does that mean? So for this particular application, this is a program for doing what's called Delaunay mesh refinement. It's a very old algorithm. It's almost 100 years old. It's used in finite elements and graphics, and I'm sure many of you know this because you probably do finite elements. It's a way of producing what are called guaranteed quality meshes. So I'm going to describe it in 2D. So the input to this algorithm is a triangular mesh of some kind. And uh, you can see the initial mesh up there. Some of the triangles in this initial mesh are badly shaped according to some shape criteria. We don't need to worry about what those criteria are. But by looking at the coordinates of the triangle, I can classify it as a bad triangle, in which case it's red. And otherwise, it's a good triangle, and I don't care about it. The objective of Delaunay mesh refinement is to essentially remove all these badly shaped triangles from the mesh. And the way that that's done is by a process of iterative refinement. Essentially, what you do is you take a bad triangle and you split it into smaller triangles. <clears throat> but if you just do that, that could violate certain other geometric constraints of the triangles around it. So what you actually do is you take a bad triangle, you compute what it's called its cavity, so there's just a small region around that bad triangle. You remove all those triangles, and then you replace them with new triangles like I've shown over there. Now, this is best seen by showing you a movie, if I can get the movie to run. OK, so we pick a bad triangle, and now we need to compute the cavity of that bad triangle. So these are all the triangles that are going to get affected. We're going to remove all of them, replace them with new triangles. And as you can see, this has created new triangles, and two of them happen to be bad. So this is what happens in the early stages of the algorithm. You fix a bad triangle, you might create more bad triangles, but you just have a work list of these bad triangles, and you just keep iterating until you don't have any more bad triangles. And now we could sit here and watch this all day, but I'm going to speed it up. And so if you just let this run, what you will see is the kind of meshes that I'm sure you've seen if you're doing graphics and finite elements and so on. OK, what we've done is rather than look at the program on the left, we talked about the algorithm, and then we talked about the data structures, a mesh, and then a work list of these bad triangles. And now if I were to ask you, is there parallelism in this algorithm or not? There is. And where is the parallelism? Let's have some audience participation here. Yeah, I'm thinking of something even simpler. If I have two bad triangles that are far enough away in the mesh that their cavities don't overlap, I can obviously do that refinement in parallel. If, on the other hand, the cavities of two bad triangles overlap, I can do them in one order or the other, but I can't do them concurrently. So in a big mesh, right, the cavities are typically small areas of the overall mesh, and so there's actually a lot of parallelism. And later I'll show you some quick numbers to show that we can actually build systems for exploiting parallelism in these kinds of irregular applications. Notice that the compiler will never be able to find this parallelism because that while loop, each iteration of the while loop is fixing some bad triangle, but you have no idea where those triangles are in the mesh at compile time. So the compiler can only come back, be conservative, and say, well, they may interfere, so sorry, don't do things in parallel. So in fact, this is parallelism that you need to find at runtime. You can't find it at compile time, unlike those dense matrix programs that work so well with these dependence-based techniques. So this is something that we're taking beyond what uh, Ken and uh, David Cook showed us. We have to find and exploit this parallelism 
at runtime. So you have to find the parallelism and exploit it at runtime. So this is a lesson, study algorithms and data structures, not programs. We all love benchmarks, benchmarks are good, but if you want to understand what you can change and what cannot be changed, you really have to look at the algorithms and data structures. There's another aspect of this application that's very important and it's called don't care non-determinism. And again, this is something that doesn't show up in the realm of matrix programs. So it turns out that the final mesh that you get in Delaunay mesh refinement depends on the order in which you process the bad triangles. So even in a serial implementation, depending on how you take bad triangles off of the list, you'll end up with different final meshes. Because if two triangles are close together, what you do to one affects what you do to the other one. This is called non uh, don't care non-determinism because it turns out for applications, you don't really care which one of these final meshes is produced, you just want one of them to be produced. So there's a certain choice that you have in how you process these bad triangles. That is very important to convey to the implementation because that gives it a lot of freedom as to where to find work to do. This is ubiquitous in irregular algorithms, so even simple things like computing the BFS tree or DFS tree for a graph, well, it's not unique, right? There are many trees and any tree is acceptable. So this is a very important concept, don't care non-determinism. It was first uh, formulated and explained by Edsa Dijkstra a long time ago. And so this is something that we need to convey to the implementation, to tell the implementation this freedom of choice that it has. Okay, so we've talked about two important concepts, right? So uh, now we've talked about don't care non-determinism. The question is, what does this mean in terms of the programming model? We ultimately want to reflect this back into the programming model and then into the implementation. The way we do it is with what we call the operator formulation of algorithms. And I'll explain it by contrasting it to the standard one Neumann way of thinking about programs and program execution, which you can call a control-centric approach to programming. So the von Neumann model is an imperative model. There's an initial state, and then there's a final state. And you get from the initial state to the final state by making these small state updates. Each state update is done by an assignment statement. So you can look at an assignment statement as a, just a local view of everything that's going on. And then, of course, in a big program, you have lots of assignment statements. You need to say what order they get done in, and that's the role of these control flow constructs. They tell you how to schedule the assignment statements to get the effect that you want. And then at runtime, you keep a program counter, and the program counter tells you where there is work to be done. Now, this is, of course, a very well-known, popular model. But as uh, John Backus, who is the inventor of Fortran, he got the Turing Award for leading the team that developed Fortran. In his Turing Award lecture, he called this the von Neumann bottleneck, because as long as your programming model has this notion of a program counter, right, then there's one place where there is activity going on. And then if you want to do things in parallel, then you get back into all this dependence analysis and so on, which we said works for some programs and doesn't work for other programs. So John's solution was to abandon imperative languages altogether, and he went to a functional model. And so he was a strong advocate of functional languages. Now, I went the other way. I did my dissertation on functional languages, and then I got totally disillusioned with functional languages. And so what I'm going to show you is the way we solve this problem, and that is by sticking with the imperative state update model but it's a data-centric way of thinking about algorithms as opposed to this control-centric way of thinking about program counters and assignment statements. So what is this data-centric approach? Well, in all the algorithms, and in particular, let's just focus on this Delaunay mesh refinement, there's a big data structure, and then there are sites in that data structure where there is work to be done. So sometimes these are nodes, and then the nodes are labels, and then you need to do something at the node and its neighbors. So we call those active nodes. In other graph algorithms, you may have active edges. Delaunay mesh refinement, you had active triangles, the bad ones. Okay, whatever it is, there's a data structure and there are sites in this data structure where there is work to be done. Now the question is, what is the work that needs to be done? Well, that is the state update that needs to be done at one of these sites. And that's what we call the operator. 
So for Delaunay mesh refinement, it consisted of expanding the cavity, removing all the triangles, and then replacing them with new triangles. So that's a state update, and it's a local view of the algorithm. It tells you what to do at one site. Now, in general, at any point during the execution of the algorithm, you may have many active nodes. And so you need to tell the implementation what freedom it has in the order in which those active nodes must be processed. And so this is what we call the schedule, or the ordering between active nodes. And so in some algorithms, like Delaunay mesh refinement, right? these are what we call unordered algorithms, because you can process the active triangles or active nodes in any order at all. In more complex algorithms, there is a predefined order in which all the active nodes must appear to be, have been processed. So if you know discrete event simulation, that's an example of an ordered algorithm. And now the question is, where do the active nodes come from? Well, there are two classes of algorithms that we call topology-driven and data-driven. In data-driven, there's an initial set of active nodes. And then when you process an active node, you may create more active nodes, and you just keep going until you don't have any more active nodes. So Delaunay mesh refinement was an example of a data-driven algorithm. In other examples, you have what we call a topology-driven algorithm. So the algorithm operates in rounds. And in each round, all the nodes are initially active. You apply the operator to all the nodes. And then if anything changes, you have another round, and you keep going. Right? So a lot of single source shortest path algorithms, a lot of graph algorithms have that particular property. So Bellman-Ford algorithm for single source shortest path is an example of a topology-driven algorithm. OK, so this is the abstract model. And now what we need to do is to say, well, what does this mean for Joe? What does it mean for Stephanie's? So let's bring it all together now. And I'm just going to focus on unordered algorithms. We've done a lot of work on ordered algorithms as well. <clears throat> so the first question you need to say is, how do I convey this don't care non-determinism to the implementation? And the way we do it is by using set iterators, which are a standard concept in C++, Java, and so on. So you have a set W, and then you say, for each E in W, do some particular, which is the operator. That's the body of the iterator, OK? And if you look up your manual for C++ or Java, they always say you cannot rely on any particular order in which you iterate through that set. You should explicitly not allow that, right? So this is exactly the kind of freedom that we want. We have a set. We're going to iterate through it in some order, processing all the elements. But you can do this in any order at all. So it turns out using the notion of set iterators is very important for expressing this don't care non-determinism. Now, there is a difference. So uh, we need these sets. We need to be, allow those sets to have new elements be added to them while we're iterating over that set, which you're not allowed to do in Java and C++. But that's OK. You just need a much more sophisticated data structure for implementing these sets. And we've done a lot of work on how to implement them efficiently in a safe way in a concurrent environment. So the Delaunay mesh refinement example, the way the pseudocode would work in our system is you basically write a for each E in WL, where WL is a work set. And then as you can see, the body of this iterator is the operator. So when that operator executes, if you create more bad triangles, you add them to your work list, as you can see at the bottom. So I'm going to skip over ordered algorithms, but the idea is essentially the same. So now what does it mean for Stephanie's, right? So that is the programming model. And what you've done with the programming model is you've told the implementation about this freedom in which you can process this work list. So that's how you expressed the don't care non-determinism. And then you also said, here is the operator. That's just the body of the iterator. The job of Stephanie's is to take that code and then generate parallel code out of it. So again, we'll just focus on unordered algorithms. So basically, what we need to do is first ensure that each of these operator applications that we call uh, activity must be executed atomically. So even though there's lots of other activities going on, each one must appear to have been executed atomically. So what that essentially means is that activities with disjoint neighborhoods, right? the blue areas don't overlap, you can do those in parallel. But if they overlap, then you can't do them in parallel. The key question, of course, is how do we find activities with disjoint neighborhoods? Right? That is the key job of Stephanie's. <clears throat> 
So one approach is to use what's called speculative execution. So in speculative execution, essentially different threads go grab different active elements, and then there are logical locks associated with the elements like the nodes in this graph. And so while you're doing that cavity expansion, for example, there's a logical lock associated with each of the triangles. And so while you're doing cavity expansion, you grab those locks if you can. If you can grab all the locks for your cavity, well then you can go and do the state update. But if you find that the lock has been acquired by some other concurrent activity, well then you roll back, you put the active element back on the work list, and then you try a different uh, active element. Okay, so this is called speculative execution. There are ways of making this more efficient than by using logical locks and so on, but I hope you have the basic idea. So this is called speculative execution. And in this class of irregular algorithms, that's the foundational execution model for exploiting parallelism. Now at this point, some of you are thinking, well, this seems like it has a lot of overhead. Do I, can I optimize away the overhead for uh, some algorithms, and in fact you can. So it turns out that uh, if you look at what is called binding time, so that's basically where are the active nodes and what are their neighborhoods. So in simple algorithms, you actually know this at compile time. So if I take a look at a stencil code, for example, so you have a finite difference code, the active nodes in each round are the interior points in this grid, so those are the active nodes, and then you know what the stencil looks like, so that's the blue area. So you know all the active nodes and neighborhoods. So the compiler can basically come up with a parallel schedule that doesn't require locking or anything of that sort. And that's how you implement uh, finite difference codes, whether it's Jacobi iteration, Gauss-Seidel iteration, and so on. In the most complicated algorithms, like some of the ones that we've been looking at, like Delaunay mesh refinement, you basically have to exploit parallelism while finding that parallelism. And so this is uh, one way to do that is by using speculative execution. So there are other execution <laughs> techniques that uh, you can also use depending upon how much structure there is in the algorithm. But the key takeaway message for you is that rather than have this compile time technique that's based on dependence analysis, which is where Ken Kennedy and David Cook and all those folks started from, right? What we built on top of that is this sort of superstructure where we have more sophisticated execution uh, techniques like speculative execution, interference graph approaches, which I have not talked about, but they let you exploit parallelism in many more algorithms than is possible with the purely dependence-based approach that was advocated by Ken and others a uh, long time ago. So we're building on his work, and at the same time, we've kind of generalized it to a much richer class of algorithms. So I want to show you one graph over here, just to convince you that uh, this isn't just vaporware. So we built a system called the Galois system, which has been used in uh, many DARPA projects. Uh, we've uh, collaborated with BAE systems uh, to build a system for doing uh, intrusion detection in computer networks. So we've used it for many different problems, parallelizing placement and routing algorithms and so on. So these are performance numbers on our old machine, SGI Ultraviolet. I just wanted to show you some big numbers over here. On the x-axis, you have the number of threads. So it goes all the way up to 512 threads, 512 cores. And then on the y-axis, you have scaling. So how fast is the, uh, so it's the time for the single-threaded uh, implementation divided by the time for how many cores you're using. And if you take a look at the green line, that's a Delaunay mesh refinement example we talked about. And remember, this was an uh, uh, application that people weren't sure where the parallelism was, how to exploit it, and so on. And what you can see is, if you take the main loop, you can get a scaling of 416 on 512 cores without writing explicitly parallel code, logs, anything of that sort, right? You just program using our Galois set iterators and then with this data-centric model and the Stephanie work that I described briefly, you can get this kind of uh, scaling. Now, those of you who know parallel computing know that showing scaling numbers can often be misleading because the real test is if I take an optimized serial code, right, how much faster than that rather than the one thread execution time. So the chart that I just popped up over there shows you 
the execution time for a particular mesh that we looked at uh, using Triangle, which is a highly optimized C code from Jonathan Shuchak's group at Berkeley. And it's serial code, so on one thread it took 96 seconds. On one thread, on our system, it takes 115 seconds. So you can see it slows down because, of course, you're taking these locks and all of these other things which are not really required in a serial implementation. But we can just add more cores, and then the same code runs in parallel. And then, as you can see, you get a very respectable speed up, not just scaling on this very difficult application. Okay? Perfect timing, John. So. A few final remarks about uh, uh, what I've talked about. So as I told you, a lot of people, John Backus, many others, right, uh, have advocated using functional languages for parallel programming, right, precisely because of this one nine one bottleneck that Backus talked about. So at this point in my life, I've come to believe that functional languages are neither necessary nor sufficient for parallel programming, okay? So I can't imagine, <laughs> thank you. It took me a long time to realize this, but yeah. So, uh, you know, they're not necessary because as I've shown you with this operator model, which we've implemented in C++, right? The Galois programs are legal C++ programs. We're getting very good performance on very complicated examples. And so you don't need to switch to a new programming model, functional languages. And uh, at the same time, I don't know how to do things like Delaunay mesh refinement in any natural way using a functional language because there's no notion of a state update. So this is a conversation for cocktail hour or something. Uh, people used to worry about, well, where do all the millions of threads come from when you have these millions of cores and so on? And if you think in terms of loops and things like that, it's a little intimidating. But if you think in terms of our data-centric model, you have a big data structure, there are sites there where there is work to be done, all of those are potentially places where you can have threads doing work. So at this point, as I was saying, this is a realization that took me many years, but uh, I once talked to David Cook when I was interviewing for an assistant professorship job a long time ago. And so David Cook asked me, what, what do you do? And I said, well, I do functional languages. And uh, those of you who know David know he's a very gentlemanly guy. And so he looked at me and he said, well, in my experience, languages can be a problem, but they're rarely ever a solution. And I thought to myself, oh, this guy has been doing Fortran for so long. Man, he's really out of it and so on. At this point, I realized what David was trying to tell me. He was exactly right. And a few years ago when he was visiting me in Austin, I told him this story. And he said, well, I don't remember telling you that. So, well, it makes for a good story anyway. This doesn't mean domain-specific languages are a bad idea. I think they're a wonderful idea because compilers are like skiers. They can go downhill easier than going uphill. So saying that languages can be a problem, they're not a solution, is not ruling out domain-specific languages. I'm really referring to this functional versus imperative debate that still goes on in our community. I think at this point, I come down on the side of imperative languages. So I put together these lessons that I have learned very painfully over the last, over the course of my career, about 30 years or so. And I'm sure many of these things like study algorithms and data structures, not programs, uh, don't care non-determinism is your friend and so on, probably seem very obvious to you. But uh, well, it took me a long time to get to this point where I could distill out everything that I had learned in studying all these irregular algorithms and patterns of parallelism and so on, and put them down on a slide, talking about data-centric abstractions and so on. So I want to leave you with this quote from one of my favorite authors. This is Ernest Hemingway. And as you know, he had this very masculine way of writing about things. This is from Death in the Afternoon which is his famous book on bullfighting in Spain. And so he writes, there are some things which cannot be learned quickly, and time, which is all we have, must be paid heavily for their acquiring. They're the very simplest things, and because it takes a man's life to get to know them, the little new that each man gets from life is very costly, and the only heritage that he has to leave. What we have done is to build on the great heritage of Ken Kennedy, and so with that, let me conclude my talk. I'm happy to take questions. Questions for Keshav? 
I have one. So in, in your work, I guess most of this has been done on CPUs. So, you know, of course, accelerators are what's hot these days. So have you done any work applying these kinds of irregular algorithms on accelerators, or do you think that, that they can be applied? They can, and uh, we have only looked at GPUs. We've not looked at any other accelerators. And so we've shown how you can compile code from this high-level data-centric notation that I talked about to GPU CUDA code, right? And so there are a bunch of papers that I'm happy to send you on those. Yeah. So GPUs, of course, are not as efficient in executing sparse code as they are with dense code. But nevertheless, you get a very good speed up just because GPUs are so fast, right? So. Other questions? Thank you. Um, I wonder if you've noticed the um, many imperative languages are adopting functional features into the language, and if you have an opinion on that. No, I think that's, a, that's actually a wonderful idea. And uh, even when I write imperative code, to the extent possible, I try to write it in a functional way. In other words, gratuitous global side effects, for example, are obviously a bad idea, right? So I think that is a movement in the right direction. And that has to do with issues of software engineering, maintainability, understandability, and so on. And I would agree completely that functional languages are, in fact, a lot better along those dimensions than imperative languages, right? But the point I'm making is that when it comes to parallelism, particularly parallelism in these kinds of complex applications, the irregular applications, right, I find it hard to understand how functional languages would be useful for that. And what we've shown is you can stick with the imperative programming model. And the, you know, we call it the operator formulation, but it's basically atomic actions in different places and then a schedule for doing the atomic operations. Those are the two things you need to understand, this data-centric way of thinking. And then you're done as far as even the most complex algorithms are concerned. But this notion of a state update, right, that's fundamentally imperative. And now maybe you know, somebody else can look at these algorithms and say, well, here is a functional way of thinking about these and so on. But I find it much more natural to think in terms of state updates. So that is the point that I'm making. So thank you for bringing that up. So software engineering, I agree completely. Right? Your code should look as functional as it can, but not more. Right? That's the way I would say. All right, let's thank Keshav again. Thank you.